Hey guys, welcome back. In this uh, video, we're going to be talking about our last integrative theory, uh, which is about which is uh, the theory of habitus and fields. Notice the U in habitus. Okay, this theory is way way simpler than it seems, given the fact it has the term habitus, the term field, and it's by a French guy named Pierre Bourdieu. All of those things kind of suggests to us that this is going to be a complicated thing. Um, there is a degree of sophistication in the idea of habitus, um, but it's not super, super hard. Uh, so let's get into it. Uh, Pierre Bourdieu comes up with this idea. It's going to be a, a, a theory that is kind of dialectical, um, meaning that one thing happens and it provokes a reaction in the other thing, which provokes an action, reaction in the first thing. Kind of like um, Archer's dualism between structure and agency. Um, yeah, Pierre Bourdieu is going to say that structure const constrains how we think and act, but how we think and act also affects our structures. So the way I want to organize it is in kind of two, two steps. First of all, what people are like. Individuals have a habitus. Second of all, what people do. They compete in fields. Um, so micro level, what's happening? People have a habitus. Habitus is going to be defined as the mental or cognitive structures through which people deal with the social world. So you can think of it kind of as a schema, a set of concepts, a, a cognitive structure um, that we are unconscious of, that exist in our brain and that affect and influence the way we approach the world and the way we conduct ourselves. That's it. Um, it is, importantly, it is an internalization of the structures in society. So, you know, you're a little kid and you learn about the world. And what you're learning about is like, you know, the way the social world works. You're learning, you know, mundane things like how, what, how do you, how to open a door or the fact that a stray dog could be dangerous or that that adult who's at the front of the classroom is a teacher and you're learning all those things and all those things are real right those are real things but you end up with a conceptual schema in your mind that's the habitus period uh and then a couple of points underneath the period the main point is that Different, not every individual in society is going to have the same habitus. And the key difference, um, according to Pierre Bourdieu, is your position in your society. So he would suggest that you and I would not have the same um, habitus, even though we both will have ideas about the same things and they'll be related to each other. But I'm going to have the same habitus as uh, as another 50-ish year old white male professor. Um, that is a position that I hold in the world um, and that it affects the way I have internalized the structures that, um, that the real structures that are out there, but the way I have internalized them is affected by my position. A woman, even a white woman who is a professor and is about 50, is going to have a different habitus. A black man in the same position is going to have a different habitus. Um, my brother-in-law, who is about 50 but is an electrician, is going to have a different habitus. So you can think of the intersection of a bunch of demographic, uh, a bunch of demographic conditions. Those are the things that that influence a habitus, um, at least in the ways that Pierre Bourdieu say are significant. There are probably, you know, there are probably other things as well. It may be that no two individuals have identical ones, but those demographics really kind of separate out a white male, 50 year old, cisgender, heterosexual habitus is going to be pretty similar to another person who fits all those demographic criteria. Um, the habitus functions unconsciously. I think I said that already. It manifests itself in how we do things. So the idea is that I will 
actually walk in a way that is consistent with my habitus and it's different than somebody else's habitus. Um, I don't exactly, like, he doesn't do a ton with that, but it's kind of an interesting thing to think about. Um, and our habitus constrains our thought and our choice of action. So I see, I understand the world from the perspective of this habitus, and it affects how I think about things, it affects what I think about, and it affects my choices of action. All right, that's the micro level. All that stuff on habitus is, um, it's a lot of detail uh, for something that basically comes down to your perspective. That's, don't write that as like, that's what habitus means. It means all the stuff I already said, but like in sort of a shorthand way, you can think about it that way. All right. So that's, that's the micro level. That's what people, that's what people are. What do people do? Um, Bourdieu says that what people do then is they step out into the world and they compete. Um, and that idea of competition is really crucial to what Bourdieu, to his whole social theory. Uh, he's a conflict theorist. He's, I don't know if he was a Marxist originally, but he absolutely looks at the field of education as an example of a field and sees competition. He looks at the field of the economy and sees competition. He would even look at the field of religion or the field of art and see competition. Um, you don't have to agree with it, but that's what he sees. Uh, he says that, um, that that's what people do. People compete in fields. And uh, what I need to do is define field for you. So first of all, a field is, uh, it's, it's going to kind of be, well, you could probably tell from the examples I gave. It's kind of like Georg Zimmel's idea of social worlds. He talked about the social world of art, the social world of religion. Um, it's like that, but it's a little bit different in the sense that Bourdieu defines it as networks of positions. So not networks of individuals, although I as an individual inhabit a position, I'm a college professor in the field of education, right? Um, the field of education is a network of positions. Um, but it's not just that, each field also has its own culture. So remember Archer was talking about how if you're just talking about structure, you're missing out on key things. Uh, Bourdieu also believes in the importance of culture. So a field is a network of positions, but each field has its own culture. And by that, he means its own logic, its own beliefs about what's important. Um, so in education, we tend to value, uh, we tend to value learning. But if you think about what you're doing in school from the standpoint of the field of the economy, who cares about education? You need to do what you have to do to have as little debt as you can have and get out into the world and, and earn a job. But that isn't the logic of education, right? Um, and it's not that one's right or one's wrong. It's just Bourdieu says, look, there's competition in these fields but there's a different sort of logic, a different set of beliefs about what's important in each one of them. So as I go from one field to another field, I'm carrying my habitus with me, but I am competing based on the logic of the education field. And then in a different place on the logic of the economy, or if I were to be involved in, to the extent that I'm involved in politics, um, that has a different logic as well. So you can think of the social world is made up of all these different fields. Okay, um, so how do we compete? Or wh first of all, what are we competing for? That's pretty simple, to preserve or improve our position. So you can think of that network of positions as having um, different hierarchical levels. So, you know, theoretically, I would be in competition with the other professors in the world to get a, uh, to move up the ranks of tenure and to become a, a full professor um, and, you know, to be highly esteemed by my colleagues. That's what I'm competing for. Um, the, this is, I think the, uh, all of this is interesting to me, but this is a place where he gets pretty specific. He says, 
Okay, so that's, that's what we're competing for. How do we compete? And he says we compete with four types of capital. Um, and I actually should have written this down here. Uh, we compete with economic capital, which just means, you know, basically money or your access to, to that kind of economic resources. Cultural capital. And cultural capital means kind of the different sorts of knowledge that you have. So I would be in competition based on my ability to flex my knowledge of sociological theory, for example. Social social capital is, uh, we talked about social capital, capital a couple of uh, videos ago. Social capital is the... Uh, we talked about it with the, the social, uh, the rational reconstruction of society, James Coleman. Um, social capital is our, our uh, relationships, uh, the social networks that we're involved in. Um, and so I could use that to compete also. It's, it is me getting published in certain journals based on who I know. Um, and then finally, Symbolic capital and symbolic capital basically is about how honored I am the, the meaning that is attached to me. So if I, you know, if Bone Lenzo becomes um, some important name in sociology at some point, then uh, that would be social, uh, that would be symbolic capital for me. Um, so that is what I am competing with. But how do I use those things? How do I use economic, cultural, social, and symbolic capital? Well, what Bordeaux says is it really depends on my habitus. Um, I, as a white male, would be able to use these things effectively in a different way than a black woman would be able to. Um, and I don't, I'm not exact, I don't know this stuff well enough to be able to say, this would be the advantage that a white man would have in terms of, in terms of these. Uh, I mean, my tendency would be to think that just my whiteness means something and my maleness means something that a black woman's blackness and femaleness doesn't mean. In our society, we tend to define whiteness and maleness as authoritative in a way that we don't define blackness and femaleness. And so I have a symbolic capital advantage. And for a woman who is just as intelligent, a black woman who's just as intelligent and capable um, with the exact same resume that I have, she would have to fight uh, to compete with a disadvantage here. So she might have to use social connections more or her knowledge would have to be better than mine. Um, which makes some intuitive sense. I mean, this is crappy. I'm sorry that I'm having to say all this, but Bordeaux's theory, when you think about the concepts that he's, the way he's broken down society and the example that I just gave, it, it kind of sounds right. I mean, it's an eminently reasonable way of thinking about the lived experience of a white male professor and a black female professor. Okay. Um, so we're, uh, we're at the end of Bordeaux. That's, that's basically it for him. Um, the last two comments though, that I need to make is he says that the field conditions habitus. In other words, what exists, what we are competing for and the culture that exists there, it influences my perspective on the world. My habitus changes as I, because habit. A habitus changes over time because my position changes over time. I go from a graduate student to a professor. I go from a young man to a middle-aged man. Um, those things change and those changes are happening as I am experiencing a field. So the field conditions a person's habitus and all the fields that a, that a person takes part in are gonna condition their perspective on the world. 
Um, on the other hand, my habitus gives meaning to the field. So the fact that I, at a certain point, became a person with a habitus that valued education, that meant that the field of higher education had meaning to me in a way that my like electish, electrician um, brother-in-law, his habitus doesn't assign that meaning to this field. Um, and so in that sense, that's where Bourdieu is getting at the idea of, of um, the micro influencing the macro and the macro influencing the micro. Okay, that's it. That's it for Bourdieu. Sorry, it's 15 minutes. Um, and that is uh, our last of these integrative theories. So all of these, what all of these have in common is an idea of the micro, some sort of theoretical approach to what's happening at either the individual or the interaction level. And then some idea of what's happening at the macro level, like Bourdieu sees all of this competition. Um, Giddens and Archer saw just the creation of these structures. And all of these theories then are going to have some idea of how the micro level relates to the macro and how the macro relates to the micro. That's what we mean by an integrative theory. All right, that's it for this week, guys. I'll see you next week.